There will be spoilers ahead for Black Mirror seasons 1 through 3. The year is 1987. It's a Saturday night in the beach town of San Junipero, and you're dancing in the club to Fake by Alexander O'Neill. And it's rad. It's really freaking rad. And the raddest part? None of it exists. It's all in an afterlife program on the servers of TCKR Systems. In this episode, we follow the love story of Kelly and Yorkie, two elder women who relive their youth in the San Junipero program. According to the series creator Charlie Brooker, the idea for for San Junipero was originally meant to be more in the horror genre, but he felt that Black Mirror's reputation of having very bleak, pessimistic episodes one after another was becoming very predictable. So Brooker wanted to make a more hopeful story and be optimistic for once. So he started to create the first script of season 3 and made it about an uplifting love story. Charlie Brooker, an executive producer of the series Annabelle Jones, had a big fascination with the afterlife. And after creating White Christmas, which focused on the digital hell, they went on to create a digital heaven. In the book Inside Black Mirror, Charlie Brooker talks about the conception of San Junipero, and how the simulation in the episode started as a place where dead loved ones would live, and you could buy access into the program to visit them. But then he thought about the young ones. Not this young ones, but the BBC documentary The Young Ones, saying they'd taken six aging celebrities in their 70s and 80s, and put them in a house decorated like the 1970s, with vintage TV shows playing on the TV and everything. And the results were astonishing. They were suddenly full of life, almost tossing their walking sticks away like they were 20 years younger. It's commendable how Charlie Brooker managed to make the dialogue in this episode sound natural, because when writing the screenplay, he was not only having to hint at dying people getting placed in this virtual heaven, he was also needing to make a bunch of old people sound young but old at the same time. And that's why Yorkie's dialogue is less suspicious, because she appeared to be young enough to be experiencing all those things for the first time. Her social awkwardness, as well as her being inexperienced in relationships, could have been realistic for someone as young as she appears to be, especially during that time period. So trust me when I say that rewatching this episode after you already know the twist is definitely worth it. Because it's not just the dialogue that hints at the afterlife program, but the pop culture media as well. During the opening scene when Yorkie walks down the street, you can see Max Headroom, a television host who's an AI living in a computer. When Yorkie goes to the 80s, Davis is seen playing Pac-Man, a game where the uh, Pac-Man character is surrounded by ghosts like how they're surrounded by dead full-timers walking the streets of San Junipero. In the 2000s, you can see the arcade game The House of the Dead 2 next to Kelly and Davis playing Dance Dance Revolution, continuing this whole we're surrounded by dead people theme. When Yorkie is in the middle of her time jumping exploration, you can briefly see the video game Time Crisis, which is fitting. The posters we see hanging over Tucker's were chosen clearly for their cultural significance, but may have also been selected for their relation to the story, like how The Lost Boys is a film about vampires wanting to live forever. In Scream, the main killer, is dressed like a ghost, and the born identity is about Matt Damon trying to recover who he is, which in a sense is similar to Kelly and Yorkie's journey. The first two times the clock hits midnight and Kelly and Yorkie are pulled out of San Junipero, the screen goes black. During this moment, you can hear what sounds like a hospital room from Yorkie's perspective. basically telling us that this is all there is to Yorkie's week before she's put back into San Junipero for the five hour time limit. By the way, speaking of small details, Kelly's mole does switch from the right side of her face to the left side when we see her in real life. And I've heard this so-called inconsistency makes San Junipero absolutely unwatchable. Now I'm just kidding. I'm going to go ahead and justify this inconsistency by saying that Denise Burse, who plays Elder Kelly, and Gugu Mabathra, who plays San Junipero Kelly, do not not look that similar to begin with, and this was something that was acknowledged during production. The reasoning for it is that the user's avatar in San Junipero doesn't have to look exactly like their younger self. But if you want the English teacher's explanation, Kelly is getting to explore the other half of herself. So the mole is a clear symbol of that other side of her. Sorry, I couldn't help myself. Are you glad I'm here to explain stuff like this? Yorkie had her accident at the young age of 21 in the year 1987. Both Kelly and Yorkie appeared to be in their early 20s. 20s within San Junipero. Later in the episode, Kelly explains that she and her husband were together for 49 years. So the story of San Junipero takes place around the year 2037. The freshness of this secular technology is what could have deterred not just religious people, but anyone else who 
was new to this idea of living inside a computer. In fact, when I posed the question to all of you if you would live in San Junipero, it was pretty 50-50. Yorkie was justified when being hesitant about entering the dance floor with another woman. You couldn't legally get married to the opposite sex in the year 1987, and everyone in 1980 San Junipero is most likely there because they were in their prime during that decade. So even though everything appears to be the fun-loving 80s, the people occupying the avatars are possibly the same ones with those antiquated ideals about gay relationships. However, as we soon find out, people are less uptight than they used to be. In San Junipero, we focus on this bisexual lesbian relationship between Kelly and Yorkie. The color scheme throughout the episode consists of the colors pink, purple, and blue, like the neon lights of the bar tuckers, as well as the clothes Kelly and Yorkie wear, like at the beginning, pink, purple, and blue. And here on the beach, pink, purple, and blue. The three colors that make up the bisexual pride flag are, you guessed it, pink, purple, and blue. So San Junipero is a town covered in reminders that this is really a safe and accepting place for someone to explore their sexuality and be who they truly are. Side note, you may think the quagmire is a depressing place where people just go to feel something. However, assuming once again that most of the users are older people from a more suppressed era, they all seem to be indulging in activities that used to be considered taboo. So it's refreshing to see a sexual liberation happening here. In order to make the decades more obvious in the program of San Junipero, they went with a stereotypical depiction of each decade. For example, in the 80s we get to see the popular media, the neon lights, oh boy them neon lights, and the fashion styles. According to the hair and makeup of the episode, Tanya Lodge, Kelly's haircut in the 80s was inspired by celebrities like Whitney Houston and Janet Jackson. Most of the tourists or full-timers in San Junipero dress like the fashion icons of the time. Kelly is even the one to point out. Look around. People try so hard to look how they think they should look. Oops, they probably saw in some movie. Yorkie's outfit sets her apart from the rest of the users, and the most iconic part of her outfit is the glasses, something she wears for comfort. It's part of her authentic self. When getting ready for her second night out in San Junipero, Yorkie goes through a few wardrobe changes, dressing up in the more iconic outfits of the time, like wearing the same dress as the character Allison Reynolds during her transformation in The Breakfast Club. When Allison goes from scary loner to jaw-dropping popular girl, Yorkie rejects each one of these these outfits and comes to the decision that she wants to keep the outfit she's most comfortable in. This scene goes against the common movie trope of nerdy awkward girl putting on a new look and then suddenly impressing everyone. Yorkie isn't trying to turn into someone else. This story is about her embracing who she is. The attention to detail in this episode is pretty outstanding, especially knowing that San Junipero was filmed in just 15 days. They filmed the interiors in London, England, UK, and the exteriors in Cape Town, South Africa. Hey, a fair amount of of Nosedive was also filmed in South Africa. Anyway, everyone involved in the project genuinely seemed passionate about making it as best as it could be, which showed in the reception of the episode, as it went on to win two Emmys for Outstanding Television Movie and Outstanding Writing for a Limited Series Movie or Dramatic Special. One of my favorite facts about the production would involve the episode's director, Owen Harris, who fought for the rain in the alleyway during the scene where Yorkie flees the dance floor. Series creator Charlie Brooker didn't think it was too logical that there would be rain in a tropical paradise simulation because it would kind of ruin the activities and the whole vibe going on in it. But if you're trying to have a 1980s synthwave retro paradise without some rain, you're making a bad decision. Harris's reasoning in favor of the rain is that it looks aesthetically pleasing for one. But most importantly, it kind of forces Kelly and Yorkie to have that conversation in the alleyway. In Inside Black Mirror, Harris later went on to say, I'm so glad I persuaded Charlie. Especially because later in the shoot, it started to rain for real, straight after Kelly's accident. The timing of the rain was bizarrely perfect, but it would have been a disaster if we hadn't agreed on the logic of rain in the first place. I don't know, personally, rain seems more logical to have in a computer simulation than fully fleshed out bathrooms. Like this person, why are you in here? What were, you, what were you doing? And was Blondie an AI or a real person working in a simulation? These are the questions that truly concern me. A bonus fact about the production is that Gugu Mabothra first read the script for San Junipero on her smartphone, because it wouldn't be Black Mirror without getting a little meta. The original score of San Junipero by Clint Mansell is rad. The vinyl for it is pretty rad too. Here's the front of it with artwork designed by Billy Butcher or Billy the Butcher. There's the back of it with all the 
songs. Some nice art that came with the album. Uh, right here in the quotations, you can see lyrics to Heaven is a Place on Earth. This is so cool. Like, I need to find a place to hang this. Then, what do we got? What do we got here? So here's what the vinyl looks like. I love how they chose to make the vinyl purple, which is the same color as the middle line of the bisexual pride flag, where the blue and the pink blend together. On this record is just Clint Mansell's score. It doesn't include the 80s pop culture songs as well as the songs from the other decades. But when it comes to the pop culture songs used in the episode, almost all of the song titles match what's happening in the story while also hinting at the main twist. For example, Fake by Alexander O'Neill and Living in a Box by Living in a Box are all hinting at the main twist of the episode. That San Junipero is a virtual world where people essentially live in a box or access it through a headpiece. The 2001 song Can't Get You Out of My Head by Kylie Minogue is also hinting at the same thing. Before Yorkie gets dressed for her second night out, the song Girlfriend in a Coma by the Smiths plays in the background. Later in the episode, we find out that Yorkie ended up in a coma after a car accident. And of course, there's Heaven is a Place on Earth by Belinda Carlisle, referring to TCKR Systems, creating what is essentially heaven on earth. When writing the script for San Junipero, Charlie Brooker was listening to a 1987 playlist and out of nowhere, heaven is the place on earth came on. In that moment, everything clicked and Brooker knew he needed to use that song. In Inside Black Mirror, he goes on to describe this revelation, saying, I just kept pressing repeat and suddenly I could see that ending. We could show a bank of servers with lights and it really would be like heaven is the place on earth. It's a joke and it resonates. Okay, perfect. Boom. In fact, from the beginning, Brooker was quite confident about getting the rights to the 80 songs he wanted that he ended up writing them into the script. Clint Mansell's girlfriend had passed away a year before he started composing the soundtrack for San Junipero. In an interview with Quietus, he goes on to talk about his experience creating the soundtrack after losing his partner, saying that undoubtedly shapes your output and the things that you hear. And I partly heard it differently because of my emotional state. Those things, combined with the John Hughes in Fluence Calm Electronic Score gave me inspiration. The characters are going through similar emotions to what I had been through. My favorite song off the soundtrack is Waves Crashing on Distant Shores of Time. There's this reoccurring whoosh that plays throughout it where it's like shh. And to me, that whooshing sound always sounded like someone getting pulled out of San Junipero. This soundtrack is amazing, and I highly recommend listening to the full thing in its entirety. It's really great. It's very atmospheric, calm, and beautiful. And it's nice. Anyway, I should probably get back to the analysis. <laughs> <laughs> the story of San Junipero was originally written to be a man and woman relationship, but as you can tell it was rewritten to be a same-sex relationship. I love how they utilize this idea of a virtual heaven where users could relive their youth. Kelly and Yorkie both chose 1987, most likely because it's the year that Kelly lost the opportunity to be with anyone else, and the year Yorkie lost the opportunity to be with anyone. Yorkie dealt with a less accepting family who wasn't okay with her being a lesbian, and on top of that, at the age of 21, she was in an accident and became a quadriplegic, explaining why she jumps back after watching the red car crash in the video game Top Speed. Yorkie would later go on to spend the next 40 years of her life in a coma. So in her youth and later in her adult years, she was never given the opportunity to truly explore her sexuality or find love. When Yorkie passes over, San Junipero becomes her new home. During her first few moments as a San Juniperan, she gets rid of the glasses, shedding this thing that she needed for comfort no longer needing it as she feels liberated in the simulation. The glasses were part of her authenticity, but now she sees the entire program as part of her authentic self. In San Junipero, we're able to see the ideal life Yorkie would have lived if she had a more accepting environment. The first big indicator of this would be the moment that Kelly and Yorkie drive off the road. In real life, it ended badly for Yorkie, but here they are fine and able to laugh it off and move past it. Almost like she's picking up her life from where she left off. Yorkie is able to drive a red convertible. That must have been the same model as the one she was driving the night of her accident. Kelly, being bisexual, was married to her husband Richard for 49 years in this more traditional marriage, never having the opportunity to explore the other half of her sexuality. After getting in a fight with her parents, Yorkie ran her car off the road. Later in the episode, after her fight with Yorkie, Kelly intentionally crashes her car, feeling like her own family is preventing her from being happy, as Kelly's struggling with the weight of her husband's ideal and 
the fact that her daughter was never given the choice between death or San Junipero. Yorkie extends her hand out to Kelly sometime after the crash, similar to how Kelly was there for Yorkie after her crash. Well, much later after her crash. Back in 2016, Emma Dibden from Esquire referred to San Junipero as the modern fairy tale, but executive producer Annabelle Jones doesn't necessarily view it the same way, as she claimed it's not exactly a happy ever after, going on to explain that it's more about being happy right now, placing emphasis on Kelly's line. Forever? Who can even make sense of forever? Kelly and Yorkie, as well as any other user of San Junipero, can opt out at any time, so the goal is not to live forever, but to get a second chance to live a life the real world never offered them. And that concludes this video essay of San Junipero. And if you like this video and you like Black Mirror, go ahead and subscribe, click the bell, click the bell, because you will be presented with more Black Mirror videos just like this one. Oh, also, if you want to further support this channel, go buy some merch. We got the orange robot head, aka the channel mascot merch. You can get it in orange or the fun constellation theme. There's a link to the store in the description below. As always, thank you so much for watching, and I will hopefully see you in my next Black Mirror Explained video.